Um, thanks. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we are on time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we are on time. Um, I'm Christopher Rasheem McMillan. I'm an assistant professor in women and gender studies and in dance here at the University of Iowa. Um, and we want to give you a warm welcome um, to Ms. Fitting's uh, symposium. And we're so thankful and happy that you're here. Um, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce Sammy Schalk. Um, uh, she's an assistant professor of gender and women's studies at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Her interdisciplinary research focuses broadly on disability, race, and gender in the contemporary American literature and culture, especially African-American literature, speculative fiction, and women's literature. Dr. Schalk's first book, Body Minds Reimagined, Disability, Race, Gender in the Black in Black Women's Speculative Fiction, which was published by Duke University Press in 2008, so actually quite new and fresh off the press, to be said. Um, it argues that black women writers of speculative fiction reimagine the possibilities and the limits of a body minds, changing the way we read and interpret categories like disability, race, gender, and sexuality within the context of these non-realistic non -realist texts. She has also begun a second book project on disability politics and contemporary African-American art and activism, including the Black Panthers and Black Lives Matters, Matters movement. Uh, let's uh, congratulate and thank uh, Professor Schock. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, so I'm, I don't have a PowerPoint for today. It's just this image that will be up here, I'll start it. I'll start with a description of it and then continue the talk. Um, we are working on getting access copies made. So at some point, Hope will come in with some papers. And if you would like an access copy, you can wave at Hope, who's standing right over there, and she'll make sure that you get one. Access copies is just literally a copy of what I'm about to read so that if it would be useful for you to follow along. Of course, we also have cart captioning, but if you would like to have a piece of paper um, with the talk to hold in front of you as you read, just gesture to hope. She'll make sure you get something. Um, but since we're waiting on those, we're just going to go ahead and, and get started. OK, so the talk today is called 504 and Beyond Disability Politics and the Black Panther Party. On May 7th, 1977, the cover story of the Black Panther, the weekly newspaper of the Black Panther Party, or the BPP, as I'll say many times throughout this talk, read, handicapped wind demands end hue occupation. The page which is on the screen, included three images. The first photo features two black men, a wheelchair user, Brad Lomax, L-O-M-A-X, and his fellow Panther member, Chuck Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N, who stands behind Brad's chair. The second image is of a blind black man named Dennis Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S, holding up a protest sign that says, you don't have to see to know. And the third picture is of a crowd of people of various races outside of a building with a seemingly non-black woman wheelchair user in the center of the frame. Cover stories are reserved for the most important or pressing news of a particular moment the choice to place a disability rights activist win on the cover of a black activist newspaper is undeniably symbolic of the party's belief that the success of the Hugh occupation, now more commonly referred to as the 504 sit-in or the 504 demonstration, was not merely important news, but news relevant and connected to the Panthers' own anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialist work. And there are access copies now, so if you would like one, go ahead and gesture. Hope will bring that to you. Thank you, Hope. We're going to need to get more, so please be patient. We'll try to get them as soon as we can. We're working on it. OK, thanks. <laughs> The placement of the success of the 504 demonstration on the cover of The Black Panther is in many ways the height of disability politics within the Black Panther Party, 
It was and is the most explicit and symbolically significant moment of coalition and solidarity with disabled people in the entirety of the paper's publication between 1967 and 1980, and thus provides a launching point for this talk. In most scholarly accounts of the 504 demonstration, the role of the Panthers is relegated to a brief mention of the party providing food throughout the 25-day occupation of the San Francisco Health, Education, and Welfare, Hugh, regional office building. Though several scholars of the Black Panther Party have written about the party's community survival programs and health activism in the 1970s, no Panther scholarship discusses their involvement in the 504 sit-in. Only Susan Schweik, S-C-H-W-E-I-K, her article, Lomax's Matrix, Disability, Solidarity, and the Black Power of 504, provides extensive scholarly engagement with this history, though recent publications by disability activists who were at the sit-in and the Longmore, L-O-N-G-M-O-R-E, Institute's Patient No More Traveling and Digital Exhibit on the 504 demonstration have added new details on the role of the BPP as well. My talk builds upon this work to further assess the BPP's engagement with the 504 sit-in, arguing that the Panthers supported the demonstration because disability rights and anti-ableism fit within their existing revolutionary ideology, even as disability was rarely an explicit part of the party's liberation agenda. My talk today comes from my second book project, tentatively titled Black Disability Politics. The larger project analyzes how issues of disability, broadly construed, have been and continue to be incorporated into black art and activism in the post-civil rights era from the 1970s to the present. Within, I define black disability politics as anti-ableist arguments and actions performed by black cultural workers which address disability within the context of anti-black racism. Black disability politics are often performed in solidarity with disabled people writ large, but the articulation and enactment of black disability politics does not necessarily center traditional disability rights language and approaches such as disability identity and pride, civil rights and civil rights inclusion. The book, therefore, seeks to identify and analyze examples of black disability politics in order to correct the frequent overlooking and misrecognition that has typically occurred in scholarly evaluations of disability and black art and activism. In addition to the work I will discuss today on the Black Panther Party, I have also written two chapters on the National Black Women's Health Project. These two organizations are my historical examples, and I rely on existing scholarship and archival data, particularly the publications of these two groups, to develop my arguments. In what follows, I will provide a brief historical overview of the Panthers and the 504 sit-in, followed by an analysis of the multiple ways the BPP was involved with the demonstration and how they rhetorically positioned disability rights in relation to their larger activist goals and ideology. I use the BPP's own explanation of their involvement, primarily via the Black Panther newspaper, to argue that black disability politics were an integrative part of their, of their revolutionary agenda and to support my book project's larger goal of demonstrating the different ways black activists have engaged with disability as a political concern. I should add a content note here that I will be reading some quotes which sarcastically use both ableist and racist language. The Black Panther Party was a revolutionary, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist organization started in Oakland, California in 1966 by Huey P. Newton, N-E-W-T-O-N, and Bobby Seale, S-E-A-L-E. -E. 
The Panthers originally focused the bulk of their activities on armed self-defense and patrol of police within black communities, rapidly obtaining national and international membership and influence. By December of 1968, the party had offices in 20 cities and its membership and influence height in, hit in 1970 with 68 cities having Black Panther Party chapters of varying size. In 1969, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, H-O-O-V-E-R, referred to the BPP as, quote, a violent prone black extremist group, end quote, and declared that the party, quote, without question represents the greatest threat to internal security of the country, end quote. Over the course of several years, the FBI and its covert counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, C-O-I-N-T-E-L-P-R-O, targeted members and suspected members of the Black Panther Party, men and women alike, for surveillance, harassment, incarceration, and violence with the, end, with the aim of disrupting and discrediting the organization among the public, its allies, and members alike. Despite this explicit governmental suppression of the party and the chaos that it created within the organization, the BPP adapted and continued its cultural, political, and community work in somewhat smaller, though nonetheless influential forms until 1982 when it officially dissolved. The shift in the form and function of the Black Panther Party was reflected in changes in their 10-point platform a document which defines the demands, beliefs, and investments of the party. The first version of the BPP's platform was drafted in October 1966, focusing on freedom and the, quote, power to determine the destiny of our black community, close quote, via calls for full employment, land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. In March 1972, however, the platform was revised in two key ways that reflected changes in the ideology and activities of the party. First, point one was changed to call for freedom and the power, quote, to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed communities, close quote. Second, the 10 points were expanded to call for, quote, completely free health care for all black and oppressed people, close quote. In this later era of the Black Panther Party, they began to more explicitly articulate and enact black disability politics. For the majority of the party's existence from 1968 to 1980, the Black Panther newspaper, their intercommunal news service, served as one of the BPP's main political tools, providing a way to inform and politically educate members while also raising money. The 10-point platform, for example, was published at the end of every issue. The Black Panther, included a wide range of news stories about injustices done to black, brown, and poor people across the country, from police brutality and unfair legal proceedings to discrimination in employment, housing, and healthcare. The paper also featured advertisements for Panther programs, political cartoons, educational and theoretical articles on social issues, and international news from other revolutionary anti-imperialist causes. At its height, the, black, the party printed 1,000, or oh, sorry, 150,000 copies of the Black Panther weekly with national and international distribution. By the late 70s, the time period that I'll be talking about today, the Black Panther was published around 5,500 copies per week and distributed nationally in select major cities such as Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, and Milwaukee. By this period in the party's history, the bulk of the copies were distributed in California, particularly the Bay Area where the BPP was headquartered. This distribution information about the Black Panther matters substantially to my arguments about the party because even though by the mid-70s, the BPP's on-the-ground community work was happening almost exclusively in the Oakland area, 
the black disability politics expressed within the paper still had wide national reach and influence. It matters that black people and other supporters of the party read about disability rights and disability politics in the Black Panther as being integral and important as, as an integral and important part of the widespread liberation and revolution they propose. The 504 demonstration was a major successful milestone in the disability rights movement. It was a 25-day occupation of the San Francisco Regional Office of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, during which over 100 protesters refused to leave until the National Hue Secretary, Joseph Califano, C-A-L-I-F-A-N-O, signed into effect regulations for Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. The 1973 Rehabilitation Act was the first piece of federal legislation dictating civil rights for disabled people. Section 504 specifically stated that programs receiving federal funds, such as public schools, universities and hospitals could not discriminate against or exclude disabled people or people on the basis of disability. While the Rehabilitation Act was signed by President Richard Nixon, NIXON, in 1973, Section 504 remained ineffective without written published regulations. After years of delays, disability rights activists nationwide organized the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, the ACCD, to agitate for official regulations for Section 504 to be drafted and approved. When newly inaugurated President Jimmy Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, -E took office, his Hugh officials attempted to create different regulations than those drafted under Ford. In response, the ACCD warned that if regulations were not signed, as is, the organization would stage sit-ins at Hugh offices across the country on April 7, 1977. While the protests in Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, New York City, Philadelphia, and Seattle lasted for a few hours, and the relatively larger protests in Washington, D.C. lasted just over a day. The protests in San Francisco continued for weeks, thanks to the careful planning and organizing by disabled activists in the Bay Area. The occupation of the Hugh Building in San Francisco garnered extensive local and national news coverage and has taken on legendary status within disability history and disability activist communities for its innovation and power. So that's all your historical backgrounds, okay. The Panthers were involved in the 504 demonstration from start to finish participating via the most commonly cited activity of providing daily food deliveries, as well as sending representatives to give speeches, putting out a press release endorsement, supporting two members of the party in their roles inside the protest, and publishing numerous articles in the Black Panther. I'll discuss each of these activities in turn. Nearly all accounts of the sit-in note that a major part of its success was due to extensive coalitional support. This support came in the form of volunteers, donations, and endorsements from a variety of other activist groups and organizations focused not only on disability rights, but also gay rights, women's liberation, civil rights, and more. Organizers of the 504 demonstration secured this support in the planning stages of the protest and expanded their reach throughout the duration of the sit-in. While the Black Panther Party was not listed as a part of the 504 emergency coalition in the very first press release by the protest organizers, according to Holland DeLille, H-O-L-L-Y-N-N, and DeLille is D apostrophe L-I-L, who acted as insider, photographer, and press for the protest, BPP member Ellis White, W-H-I-T-E, 
spoke at a rally on the first day of the demonstration, April 5th, 1977. DeLille quotes White as later saying, quote, and this is a longer quote, we've always been involved. We've had reps here from the beginning. The issue is self-determination, more human rights, whether handicapped people have a right to survive. Whatever they do to ensure survival, we support. Califanos threw drug addicts and alcoholics out of the handicap group. They belong to. The issue is money. It's in keeping with our principles. Survival. Close quote. Here, White insists not only upon the early involvement of the Panthers in the 504 demonstration, but also how their involvement was directly in line with the party's principles. That is, the 10-point platform, which first and foremost called for freedom and self-determination for all oppressed communities. The Black Panther Party understood disabled people, along with other people of color, people in poverty, women and gays and lesbians to be fellow oppressed members of society who had to fight for survival in a racist and ableist capitalist system. The BPP's solidarity with disabled people in general and the 504 protesters specifically is further articulated in their April 8th, 1977 press release written and delivered by Michael Fultz, F-U-L-T-Z, editor of the Black Panther. The statement reads, quote, along with all fair and good thinking people, the Black Panther Party gives its full support to section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act and calls for President Carter and Hugh Secretary Califano to sign guidelines for its implementation as negotiated and agreed upon on January 21 of this year. The issue here is human rights, rights of meaningful employment, of education, of basic human survival, of an oppressed minority, the disabled and handicapped. Further, we deplore the treatment accorded to the occupants of the fourth floor and join with them in full solidarity." Close quote. Like White's statement above, here, the party's official public endorsement also emphasizes human rights, survival, and solidarity among oppressed groups. The BPP's role, however, was not limited to being a supporter in name alone. The party also contributed in key material ways. First, two members of the party, Brad Lomax and Chuck Jackson, on our cover here, the disabled and non-disabled black men featured on the May 7th cover, were on the inside as part of the sit-in and also acted as two of the representational delegates to Washington, D.C. for the 504 Coalition. As a disabled member of the Black Panther Party, Lomax worked to incorporate disability politics into the efforts of the party. That said, as a rank-and-file member, Lomax's work had to still align with the goals and ideology of the party. In an interview with former BPP leader Elaine Brown, E-L-A-I-N-E-B-R-O-W-N, asserts that Lomax's participation in the 504 demonstration and his work at the Center for Independent Living was considered part of his work for the party. Brown elaborates that while Brad Lomax, who became a wheelchair user after becoming a member of the party, and Ed Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, leader of the Center for Independent Living, brought awareness of disability rights to the Panthers, the party's existing ideology, ideological position of focusing on systemic change for all marginalized groups meant that further transforming their thinking to include disability politics, quote, wasn't hard. Brown states that soon after being away, made aware of disability politics, the party ordered all of the party's buildings to install wheelchair access ramps. This is an example, therefore, of the key role that multiply marginalized individuals play in acting as a bridge between groups, fostering the further development of disability politics within the BPP. 
indeed, Brad Lomax was an essential figure whose multiply marginalized identities undoubtedly fostered the BPP's support of the 504 sit-in, their most direct involvement with disability rights. But that support could not have occurred without the existing revolutionary ideology that undergirded all of the Panthers' work. This is not to diminish Lomax's important historical role, but rather to acknowledge that the BPP's disability politics did not start, end, or rest entirely on the shoulders of one individual. As most accounts of the Panthers' involvement in the demonstration state, the Panthers also contributed materially by donating food. More specifically, once it became clear that the sit-in was going to continue beyond a day or two, the party began bringing daily hot dinners such as fried chicken and meatloaf. The BPP also, according to Brown, brought in mobile showers for the protesters and supplied a form of security as well. While the exact form of this security is unclear, it is apparent that the members of the party, familiar with the tactics of federal agencies and the police, ensured that supplies got through the door. For example, one Black Panther article stated that more than a week into the sit-in, quote, with all incoming telephone service abruptly cut off and all food entry denied, party members saw that a sympathetic guard discreetly allowed the breakfast food they had brought upstairs to the demonstrators. Not clear how that happened, but that's what happened. Close quote. <laughs> they just saw to it, that's all. <laughs> Similarly, in her memoir, Corbett O'Toole, C-O-R-B-E-T-T, -T, O apostrophe T-O-O-L-E, writes, quote, I happened to be in the lobby the first night that the Black Panthers brought us dinner. The FBI blocked them and told them to leave. The Panthers, being extremely sophisticated about how to manage police interactions, merely informed the FBI that they would be bringing dinner every night of the occupation. They would bring the food, they would set it up, and they would leave. If the FBI prevented them from doing that, they would go back to Oakland and bring more Panthers until the food got delivered to protesters. The FBI soon backed down." Close quote. <laughs> The material support provided by the Panthers in the form of members on the inside, food, and supplies was essential to the longevity of the protest. But perhaps more importantly for the historical record is the extensive coverage of the demonstration the party provided in their newspaper. The Black Panther provided the most national coverage of the 504 protest. Only a local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, covered it more often. The party published 10 articles and announcements of varying lengths about the demonstration between April 16th and July 7th, 1977. After the demonstration ended, the 504 sit-in was mentioned an additional eight times in the newspaper in related stories such as protest systematic exclusion disabled Sioux AC transit and disabled score victory over supermarket barriers and blind mother fights bias for custody of children. These stories typically featured events which, fe which included former 504 protesters. The Black Panther coverage of the demonstration is significant because it meant that thousands of black people were being informed of disability rights in a way that framed disability politics as directly connected to black community concerns as part of a larger radical agenda for freedom for all oppressed communities. The impact of a major black activist organization directly supporting and increasing awareness of disability rights among black Americans cannot be directly calculated. The national distribution of the Black Panthers coverage of the 504 sit-in disrupts the common narrative that people of color have primarily distanced themselves from disability and illustrates at least one way that black activists embraced and understood disability politics as a necessary interrelated part of collective liberation overall. The articles in the Black Panther portrayed the sit-in as an important necessary act, calling it, quote, 
a powerful and significant protest for human and civil rights of handicapped and disabled people, close quote. The rhetoric in the paper makes clear the connections between the disability politics being enacted in the sit-in and the work the Panther had already been doing to increase the freedoms of oppressed people. In the first article on the demonstration, for example, the paper noted that, quote, Despite stereotypes and stigma, real and very much alive, protesters have embarked upon a serious drive to control and transform the oppressive conditions of their lives." Close quote. The emphasis on oppression, stereotypes, stigma, and other socio-political concerns in the Black Panthers' representation of the 504 sit-in presented readers a social model of disability that paralleled the BPP's own understanding of race and class oppressions. In an address at a victory rally after the end of the demonstration, leading member of the BPP, Erica Hudgens, E-R-I-K-A, H-U-G-G-I-N-S, a former political prisoner who was denied adequate medical care during her incarceration, made the connection of oppressions explicit when she stated, quote, the United States has always had its niggers and they come at all sizes, shapes, colors, classes, and disabilities. The signing of 504, this demonstration, the sit-in, this beautiful thing that has happened these past weeks, is all to say that the niggers are going to be set free." Close quote. To the Black Panther Party, therefore, disability rights were an obvious part of their goal to obtain freedom and self-determination for all oppressed communities. Here, abstracting niggers into a synecdoche for all those excluded and, so and exploited within the US, rather than as a term specifically tied to blackness and race. As several scholars of race, gender, and disability have argued, oppression analogies, those in which one oppression is compared to another, while often intended as a way to promote connection or, or identity similarity, can easily end up reifying one oppression in the name of fighting another, erasing the presence of people located at the intersection of multiple oppressions or appearing to rank one oppression as worse or more prevalent than the others. In the case, case of Huggins' speech, however, I would argue that her use of nigger does not negate or rank racism or ableism while also leaving space for the intersection of black disabled identity. Additionally, in line with the Panthers' critiques of the federal government, the newspaper also highlighted how the Ford and Carter administration's failures to follow through with implementing the 504 regulations. Unlike other nationally distributed newspapers, which often mention 504 regulation implementation costs and resistance rationales alongside coverage of the protest, the Black Panther focused on rights, access, and empowerment. The one time the paper did mention the cost of mandating accessibility, it was in order to critique a cost-benefit model of decision-making. The editorial sarcastically asked, quote, how much will it cost us for you people to have your human rights, close quote, before detailing the estimated cost alongside the profits, quote, the newly employed disabled people will add to the gross national product, close quote. The article estimates that, Quote, to allow 35 million Americans to have equal access, barrier-free environment necessary to live fully, full and decent lives will cost a little over eight and a half cents per disabled person, close quote. The editorial continues by stating, quote, how much? Well, from the human point of view, a great deal more than the racist and reactionaries are willing to give up without a fight. If the rednecks and others don't have cripples to hate and make fun of anymore, if niggers and the rest of, of the oppressed in the society aren't the enemy anymore, then who will all that anger and frustration built up within the silent majority be turned against?" Close quote. Here, once again, the party makes direct connections between the operation of racism and ableism in ways that do not seek to compete or compare, rather connect. As with oppression analogies discussed above, 
One of the concerns with analyzing how marginalized groups discuss, quote, other forms of oppression is that those who are multiply marginalized are sometimes erased from the conversation. In the case of the Black Panthers coverage of the 504 sit-in, however, black disabled people and disabled people of color were prioritized. In addition to the direct involvement of black disabled Panther Brad Lomax, the newspaper published an interview with Dennis Phillips, the black blind man pictured on the May 7th cover. In the interview, Philip encourages his, quote, brothers and sisters that are black and that are handicapped to get out there. We need you. Come here. We need you. Wherever you are, we need you. Close quote. The interview with Phillips was edited, so the choice of what to include is purposeful. It is particularly important that the editors included the following statement from Phillips. Close or quote. I'm not a member of the Black Panther Party. I'd like to join the Black Panther Party. I am a member of the Black Panther Party as far as my own initiative and soul is concerned. They have fed us. They have given us respect. They have treated us as human beings. Close quote. This quote not only reflects the BPP in a positive light, emphasizing their coalitional work, but it also suggests that the Panthers wanted to highlight the potential for more black disabled involvement and inclusion within their work via Phillips' statement. Additionally, this interview with Phillips and a later interview with Lomax together acknowledge the particularity of the lives of black disabled people and other disabled people of color. A decade before the coining of the term intersectionality, Lomax referred to being black and disabled as, quote, multi-disabilities, close quote. While in another article on the congressional hearings at the San Francisco Hue office, the Black Panther made sure to include mention of a minority panel of four people who, quote, all of whom eloquently expressed the double whammy experienced by handicapped minorities, close quote. The choice to include explicit representations of disabled people of color demonstrates the BPP's commitment to intersectional thinking. Additionally, throughout their coverage of the demonstration, the Black Panther interviewed, quoted, and named several other individual protesters, often protesters of color, alongside the main white disabled leaders of the protests, such as Judy Human, H-U-E-M-A-N-N, Kitty Cohn, K-I-T-T-Y-C-O-N-E, and Ed Roberts, who, along with Hugh officials and politicians, were the ones most often interviewed and quoted in other national papers. The inclusion of so many rank and file protesters in the BPP's coverage of the sit-in reflects the party's emphasis on the power of the people and the role that every individual has to play in a revolutionary agenda. All of this is not to say, however, that there was no ableism within the party or within its representation of disabled people and disability rights. The Black Panthers' coverage of the 504 demonstration occasionally used ableist language, such as describing the protest as inspiring or most poignant, while repeatedly referring to Brad Lomax as being, quote, victimized by multiple sclerosis, close quote. This language, Schweik argues, reveals, quote, a, lack, a general lack of disability consciousness, close quote, within the BPP. Schweik's choice of the term disability consciousness here is essential because it highlights the Panthers were generally not yet aware of how language was being used and transformed within disability rights communities, even as they supported work emerging from disabled activists. That said, Within the overall rhetoric used in the articles about the sit-in, the language leans towards progressive for its time, such as using both handicapped and disabled as descriptors. <clears throat> Furthermore, the intent was still predominantly aligned with a disability rights approach rather than with a medical or charity model of disability that words like victim and inspiring might suggest. Of course, intention cannot be the sole basis for assessing ableist language. Oppression, discrimination, and harm can occur regardless of intent. 
Nonetheless, when analyzing potentially ableist language among people attempting to work in solidarity with disability communities, but who do not yet know the right language, there is utilitarian political value in reading closely and in context, including intention of the overall text and the frequency, severity, and style of use of potentially ableist language. While disability studies scholars and disability rights and justice activists may want to completely banish slurs like the R word, other words like inspiring are not ableist in and of themselves, but rather are often used in ableist ways. There is value, therefore, in closer analysis of how language is being used in a specific context, rather than merely identifying the existence of potentially ableist words. In the case of the Black Panther, inspiring was almost always used in conjunction with another adjective, such as inspiring and powerful protest, tremendous inspiring victory, or spectacular and inspiring victory, which, while not completely negating the potentially ableist implications, suggests that what was inspiring was the protest's power, length, and success, more than merely the fact that it was done by disabled people. Importantly, the words inspiring and inspiration were never used to describe any disabled individual, but rather exclusively in reference to the protest, the victory, and once to the fact that the black civil rights song, We Shall Overcome, was used as, quote, an unofficial theme song and source of hope and inspiration by the protesters. Reading the use of inspiring and inspiration in these specific contexts then, and within the scope of the BPP's involvement in the 504 demonstration, I would not consider the use of these words ableist, though I would consider the repeated references to Lomax as a victim of his multiple sclerosis, representative of latent ableist beliefs, even as Lomax was supported and respected as a member of the party. Taken as a whole then, the Black Panther was perhaps imperfect in its execution, but the party strongly supported the 504 de demonstration in material and ideological ways because of their existing revolutionary agenda seeking freedom and self-determination for all oppressed people. The BPP's support of the demonstration in the form of public endorsements, members participating in the sit-in, delivery of food and other supplies, and extensive coverage in their newspaper is representative of how the Panthers' ideology included space for disability politics. The success of the 504 sit-in depended upon a number of factors. The planning, tenacity, and creativity of the protesters, the extensive media coverage which put, which put pressure on politicians, even, ironically, and even ironically, the ableism of employees at the Hugh office who deeply underestimated the resolve and capabilities of disabled people, notoriously patronizing protesters on the first day by serving punch and cookies. The occupation could not have lasted as long and as safely as it did, however, without the extended network of supportive group, groups and organizations such as the Black Panther Party. Schweik argues, that this support is often framed as coming from other activist groups in a way that erases the connections and overlaps between social justice organizations and individual identities. Taking up an expansive approach to identifying and analyzing black disability politics addresses this potential erasure. In regard to the Black Panther Party specifically, Understanding their enactments of disability politics requires looking beyond the singular, though important, moment of the 504 demonstration toward the party's additional engagements with disability and ableism, as I do in my larger project. The black, dis black disability politics are most often enacted within and alongside other not disability exclusive concerns in specific relationship to race and class, and without 
explicit or focused engagement with the methods and languages of the mainstream disability rights movement. This is apparent, for example, in the Panthers' health activism via free clinics and awareness-raising ad and test campaigns for sickle cell anemia, as well as the party's collaboration with mental disability and mad activists in protesting the return of psychosurgery. Indeed, black activism within and against the medical and psychiatric industrial complex is perhaps the most obvious location within, within which to locate black disability politics, as the medical industrial complex has long been primarily a primary battleground for disabled people. Importantly, however, the power of the disability system and the medical and psychiatric industrial complexes extend far beyond the explicit confines of doctor's offices, clinics, and hospitals into law, prisons, media, education, and other cultural arenas in which disability politics may be enacted. We see this in the party's founding of the Oakland Community School, which educated black children who were pushed out of public schools and deemed uneducable, as well as the Black Panther, Panther newspaper's coverage of a lawsuit against California public schools' use of IQ, racist IQ tests for special education placement. While none of these issues or actions were ever framed as disability issues by the party, their involvement and attention to disability and health as racialized political concerns demonstrates that in order to understand black disability politics, disability studies, and black studies scholars must expand our understanding beyond the framework of disability rights alone. Thank you. Um, are we doing questions? I don't remember how long this goes, but we'll just take questions until someone tells me to stop. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And can I just put it on? You're right. Continue. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll take questions. To do that, you put your hand in the air. And then a microphone will maybe appear in your hand in a moment. <laughs> um, thank you, Sammy um, and Michelle. Um, I have a question about the work that you're doing in terms of um, placing the Black Panther Party in sort of a, of a black box. Like, what is the move in terms of seeing the party as this monolithic entity as opposed to trying to Touch it out. I mean, I'm wondering if this is the first step in the project in terms of thinking about how diverse actors within the party are acting versus sort of having this monolithic view of the BPP. So for me, I'm not a historian. Um, <laughs> so for me, this is very much a, a cultural product and a reading of the discourse. So the reason that I emphasize both for the Panther Party and for the National Black Women's Health Project, the second group I look at, I really focus on the um, text that they were producing in their newspaper and newsletters um, with an eye towards what does it mean that this was going out to like black people across the country and the larger influence on that. Um, one of the difficulties of the Panther Party is because it was set up with this kind of military structure of like leadership and rank and file. So a lot of the publications in the paper, like the stories, no author name, so we don't know who's writing these half the time. We only really know the, the main leadership. Um, so for me, kind of figuring out the individual actors is, is a great lofty goal, but I'm really interested in the ideologies that they were putting out as part of, for me, speaking back to um, the trend that I really see in disability studies of people being like, well, um, Doug Banton's article that everyone cites and says, we'll see people of color and women and gay folks like distance themselves from disability because it was used against them, right? Um, 
And it's totally true, there are many places we see that, but I feel like that's been used as an excuse to not look closely at what black folks and other people of color are actually saying and doing. And so for me, the focus is really on this ideology. Um, the hope is that there's a follow-up project to this that is looking at individual, um, probably more contemporary, um, activist-oriented artists. Um, but once I got into the archive and realized how much was in there, I realized that this was its own project by itself um, and trying to kind of articulate what are the trends in, dis in black disability politics that I see. And the hope is that folks can then kind of take this model and identify these trends to then go look elsewhere and see that it's been happening in all these places, but they're not using the language and the keywords that disability studies tends to look for. Thank you, Sammy. This is a wonderful project. Um, and I have two, one kind of, two, one question, one comment. Um, and the first one is to ask you just a little bit about a speculation, not that I'm suggesting you should have this be part of your project, but we talked a little bit about this. Do you have any thoughts about um, how to account for um, the situation um, now, let's say, or the history of this in that people like Elaine Brown, um, who you've quoted, who's writing books, uh, Kathleen Cleaver, who's a law professor at my university, um, Angela Davis, who of course is a professor um, emerita now at um, in history of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz, where they are now compared to where Huey Newton, let's say, and Bobby Seale are now, both of whom are dead, but also who whose trajectories did not take the direction that let's say the women. Um, some of the women involved in the Black Panther movement might have taken. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that, not that you should necessarily include it in your project. But the other thing that um, I think would be interesting for you to put in your project, and man, I hear you about I am not an historian, um, because we do, do different methods for sure, um, that you're doing this close textual analysis, if you will, or this close reading of the newspapers, I think is a really good, um, a really good strategy, but it would also be interesting to think about doing a close reading, if you will, of uh, an occupation as a genre of performance that was very distinctive to that era um, and to the enterprise, of course, of um, what we think of as black civil rights. And maybe how the um, performance, the choreographies, if you will, of an occupation as a genre of protest might have operated. Because that's really what you're talking about with the, like, who's opening the door and where the police are and how the food gets in. It might be interesting to use that analysis as part of what you're doing as well um, and to read an occupation the way you're reading the newspapers. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the kind of gender roles and gender leadership, um, I do in the larger chapter um, spend a little bit of time at least talking about the influence of the shift in gender leadership. So um, and Panther scholars have different reads of this. So there are some scholars who are like, well, men were more targeted by the FBI. I mean, we do see evidence that men were more targeted for assassination by the FBI, but women were very much targeted for violence, for incarceration. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that plays out, but what we do see is that after several leaders were um, assassinated or incarcerated, um, male leaders, women really took leadership of the organization. And so that turn in 72 is also when women took major control of the organization and turned towards community um, 
work. And so like starting the school and doing the health clinics. And so I think that there is a way to think about a black feminist approach that was occurring to say, look, we are under attack and we need to like turn in and come together on this more focused groundwork than the kind of expansive, how many um, places, like how many chapters can we open up across the world um, approach that clearly was, was being destroyed. I mean, the FBI had um, field locations for Cointelpro in 46 states, 46 states to just all aimed to destroy the Panther Party, to take it down as the greatest internal threat, right? So massive, massive um, like <laughs> shutdown of that organization. Um, so there was no way that they could continue in the way that they were. Um, and for many Panther scholars, they really consider that turn um, in the early 70s as, as almost a completely different organization. So only um, Alondra Nelson, A-L-O-N-D-R-A-N-E-L-S-O-N, her book, Body and Soul on the Panther's Health Activism was really, um, I think, a turning point for Panther scholarship where people started to say, oh yeah, they were still doing things, right? They didn't just die off completely as an organization. They shifted what they were doing. And just because it was no longer men holding guns, because um, also California changed their open carry laws in response to the Black Panthers activism so that they could not carry open weapons, um, there's still stuff going on. So now we're seeing a lot more um, Panther scholarship that's looking at this era and looking at health activism, but still no one really talking about it as anything in relationship to disability. Uh, this is Margaret. Hi, Margaret. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I think it's increasingly urgent to really unpack uh, ways that histories and dynamics and rhetorics of oppression are both compared uh, and also intertwined. Um, so thank you. I've, I've learned so much just listening to you today. Uh, I was especially struck by the way that you are analyzing different discourses, um, different dominant discourses, and the ways that um, uh, sort of familiar stories about race and um, uh, disability are told. It, caught my attention that um, the dominant story by white disability studies scholars that has been told circulates around food, which is perhaps attached to stories about service, whereas the story that I, I think I hear you lifting up is about, um, uh, in part, about literacy and communication. Um, I actually don't know if I'm going the right direction with like this, but it really caught my attention that what was emphasized was the provision of food and what has not been emphasized is the provision of knowledge and information. And I just wondered if you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's partially just a, a shifting of the perspective on the narrative. I think the majority of the time that the 504 sit-in has been written about, um, it's been written about from the perspective of the protesters, which makes total sense, right? But most of those protesters were not directly connected to the Panthers. Um, I often feel like when I read um, citations or mentions, it's also kind of like this cool cred, like, yeah, the Panthers were there. Like, <laughs> that makes it so real and so cool. Um, and that does make it real and cool. Um, <laughs> But also there's just such, there's so little attention to like, why were they there? How did this happen? Like very little work from the perspective of like, why would the Panthers choose to be involved in this? There's, there are all kinds of things happening. Why this and why as extensively as they had? Um, very few folks talk about all of these articles that they wrote that I'm like, once I got into the archive and saw it, I was like, no one's writing from the perspective of what the Panthers are doing and their revolutionary ideology. So for me, it's about shifting the narrative of disability rights and disability activism from the position of mostly white disabled activists to the black activists that were doing this work and may or may not have been disabled, right? We know of Lomax um, because of his primary role there, but in my work of looking through the archive, we see lots of examples of Panthers um, being injured um, through violence as well as things like 
denial of health care in prison for someone who had arthritis and whose like uh, fingers were swelling up, right? Or for pregnant women who were incarcerated as um, Panther members. So we see all these other moments that again, folks weren't calling themselves disabled, and yet we know that there were black disabled people there. Um, so that's part of my move here is to move away from disability identity specifically and really look at what was the kind of underlying again like revolutionary ideology um, that was often fueled by connection to experience with disability that may not have been labeled disability. So again, the, the newspaper is full of these like engagements with healthcare and the denial of healthcare and um, housing conditions that were causing all of these health concerns, um, police violence that was disabling people, um, but never named as disability politics, right? And so that is what I'm really hoping this project can get people to do is to go to, to get black scholars who are looking at black history to have this lens and to get disability studies scholars to expand the way we're looking for disability in the past. Yeah. I already have Hi. the mic. My name is Bob and I graduated from the university in 1972. So I know the world before 504 mm -hmm. and I know the university before 504 and we wouldn't be here today without 504. So I just want to thank you for focusing on it today and teaching us so much about it. Thank you. Yes. Oh, right around that way. <laughs> and actually, what I might do, because we're getting a little close to time, is how about if we take several questions? Sure. Would that be OK? And yeah. Um, so my question for you is, um, I just wonder if you see as strong of partnerships between um, groups like the Black Panther and the disability rights movement um, happening still today, if you think those partnerships as, are as strong, and if not, what op opportunities do you see for those sorts of, um, those sorts of partnerships, I guess is what cool. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, my question definitely plays on that. I was going to ask how how you would want uh, modern activists to take this historical evidence uh, and and do better today. Yeah. Um, I think my question um, was sort of along the lines of the performance. Um, but when I'm when I'm looking at like uh, your photograph of the archive, I'm wondering if the dif what are the limits of like a sort of performance theory, performative way of looking and gazing, and like when we're thinking about like the Woodworth counter, or we're thinking about like the sanitation strikers, it's through the eyes of white newspapers. Mm -hmm. But how is it? How might we? How might you imagine that? Um, using the language of the Black Panthers actual art, like not only like the embodied archive, like in a Diana Taylor sort of way, but the actual physical paper printed does, might do something that performance, um, as clever as it is, can't do. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Yes, okay. <laughs> Just gonna write, the, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> Okay, so partnerships now, absolutely. So for one, I think that we now see the emergence for sure of like black disabled activists that are explicitly identifying themselves as, as black disabled activists. So I would recommend looking at the work of the Harriet Tubman Collective. Um, they in particular um, have put out statements in response to, for example, when the Movement for Black Lives launched their political agenda platform um, and it did not include disability, they released a statement about this and a critique and it now does include disability as part of the Black Lives Matter platform. Um, so their work, they've continued to do a lot of work on the relationship between race and disability and police violence. Um, so they are definitely a place to look for that. Um, but then there are also spaces where I think, and this is, I'm still figuring out whether it's gonna be like one chapter, a chapter and a conclude, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what it's gonna look like um, for the rest of this book. But I do wanna make the contemporary turn in the book for the, the final portion. Um, and what I'm hoping to look at is also, um, BYP 100, Black Youth Project 100. They're based in Chicago, although there are chapters across the country. Um, and they are black activists 
ages 30 and under, um, and they had this super broad black feminist queer activist agenda that consistently and actively includes disability, um, even as they, again, don't necessarily name disability in everything they do. Um, they have a blog that regularly puts out things about disability. Um, one of their leaders came out with a book recently called Unapologetic, where she spent some time talking about how um, she doesn't know enough about disability issues and that disability issues are a place where she knows she has to step back and listen rather than lead. Um, so I think that's an example of contemporary groups that, again, aren't explicitly naming themselves as a disability rights group, but understand disability justice as deeply tied to racial justice. Um, the other example for me that I'm hoping to write about um, are um, healing justice movement work and The Body is Not an Apology, um, which is a, a website and a movement um, by Sonia Renee Taylor, Taylor S-O-N-Y-A-R-E-N-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Um, and um, The Body is Not an Apology um, is she put out a book um, based on this where she talks about disability essential. And in fact, the title The Body is Not an Apology comes from a conversation she had with a disabled poet, where the disabled poet, um, she's a slam poet, was talking about um, not feeling like she could articulate her boundaries and desires within a sexual relationship because of her disability. And Sonia Renee Taylor, um, in, in this conversation, told her, your body is not an apology. And that became like the center of this movement to think about not needing to apologize for our bodies and our bodies not being something that we have to excuse. Um, so all of these spaces that I'm seeing, black folks really start to include disability, but again, not in this disability identity central way. Um, so those are the examples of the contemporary work. And so I would say that kind of leading to that, the what I want modern activists to do better is to incorporate disability um, across the board and no matter what kind of work they're doing but also for disability activists to slow their roll a little bit, right? <laughs> um, there's such an emphasis on using the right language, identifying, identifying with pride that doesn't quite leave the space for folks who are really grappling with the disabling effects of racial violence um, to understand what disability means to our communities. Um, so that's what I need from folks, like to help us think through that. Um, and what I hope that this work can help us do as scholars and as activists, I really hope that this project is read by both scholars and activists. I'm really aiming for something that is accessible and useful to a lot of folks. So um, that's why I hope to make that contemporary turn. Um, in terms of what the paper can do as performance or versus performance, um, I think one thing is that the paper is really this like, I mean, it says, right, intercommunal news service. It's about the community building and consciousness raising in a way that is about us rather than about performance for others. That I think the paper, that for me is what has been really driving my interest in focusing on the paper so much is I'm like, what? What does it mean to be like a black activist in Milwaukee to get the paper and this is on the cover, right? This is the thing that my like organization that I'm connected to is telling me is the most important political thing that's happening right now. Um, that maybe I wasn't thinking about disability before or I don't think of myself as disabled, but this is what is on the cover. This is the thing. Um, there's no real way for me to trace that like affective thing, right? That's like the work of historical fiction for me to imagine what that might mean for a black disabled person in Milwaukee or Chicago who didn't yet have community to see the Black Par Panther Party um, centering it. But I, I believe and hope that um, it really did lay some groundwork that I want, I want disability studies and disability activists to acknowledge um, that it wasn't just Black Panthers were helping disabled people, but Black Panthers were really spreading the word that disability rights is essential to collective liberation, and there is no way for us to all be free like without this being part of the agenda. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>